I, I posted a video on my YouTube channel covering some of the arguments against market cap weighted index investing. Uh, basically, the premise is that all investors are different. And while the market portfolio is theoretically optimal for the average investor, investors who are different from average may consider accommodating their differences through their asset allocation decisions. Uh, like if an investor is exposed to certain risks outside their portfolio, uh, in their job or, or their business, or whatever other economic risk exposures they may have outside of their financial asset portfolio, they may want to avoid those risks in their financial asset portfolio. While on the other hand, an investor who is not exposed to any risks outside their portfolio, like a, a retiree might be a good example, uh, they may want to tilt their portfolio toward the risks that most investors want to avoid. Anyway, I, I thought it was an interesting, I thought it was an interesting uh, concept for a video. Um, and the ideas for it came from some of the past Rash Reminder episodes that, that to me were really impactful. So I drew on our conversation with John Cochran. Uh, I had uh, Fama in there, Robert Merton, of course, uh, where that whole idea of, of uh, covariance with stuff outside of your portfolio or covariance with other states of the world, that, that whole idea comes from his intertemporal uh, CAPM. Uh, and then there, there was, I, I also had in my mind when I was working on this video, uh, when we talked to Jonathan Burke, he talked to us about uh, the reasons that, that you would want to be a market cap weighted investor if you're not sure about uh, why you would otherwise trade. Like if you don't know how you should be different from the market, you're exposing yourself to a lot of risk of uh, making a mistake basically that will get exploited by a, a skilled active manager. Um as a supplement to that video, and the reason that I'm that I'm talking to you right now is uh, as a supplement to that video, we've pulled together not not a ton, but a handful of uh, five five clips from past rational reminder episodes that I think reinforce uh, the points that I was trying to make in uh, in the video over on my channel. So that that's it. I, I'm probably being long winded, uh, but I hope that these clips are are useful. And, and I hope that they give people who maybe came here from my YouTube channel, uh, a little bit of exposure to the type of stuff that we do on the rational reminder podcast. I, I, I want to shift to another concept that you had in your, in your most recent paper. Uh, I don't know if it's, if it's the most recent, but the portfolios for long-term investors paper, uh, the, the concept of general equilibrium. So the average investor holds the market portfolio. They, they have to, but most investors are not the average investor. So if someone's sitting down thinking about how they should be different from the market, what are the important sources of heterogeneity that they should be thinking about? Well, I, um, uh, before we get to what are the most important sources, let me repeat your question at great length <laughs> okay. because I think there's a deep insight there. Uh, most people thinking about the market think only, well, um, do I want to buy or do I want to sell? Do I think the price is going up or the price is going down? Uh, is this a risk I want to take and, and I don't want to take? It's a very hard uh, question to answer. But you should always, uh, any, anytime someone wants to sell you something, you should ask yourself, what does he know that I don't know? Why is he selling? Now, most people think he's selling because a moron and I'm smarter than he is. But he thinks he's the smart one and you're the moron. So one of you is wrong. This is a theorem. One of you is wrong. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, how do you get around that, uh, that conundrum? And, and that's, so you, you mentioned it very quickly, but let me just take a deep breath. The average investor holds the market portfolio. The average investor must hold the market portfolio. That's just the definition. The average is the average. Uh, all the children can't be above average as Garrison Keillor, uh, famously, uh, famously said, uh, well, he said the opposite and it was a joke. <laughs> Uh, now that means if you are, if you look, you know, honestly uh, in the mirror and say, I'm not any smarter than average, I'm not any, um, I don't have any better than average ability to hold risks or analyze the economy, then you can just, you should hold the market portfolio. And in fact, um, anything but holding the market portfolio is a zero sum game. Mm. So, uh, Investing in general is a wonderful thing to do because it's not a zero sum game. Uh, if you invest in the stock market, um, you know, if you take your savings and invest in the stock market, you don't make money at somebody else's. This is the, the big fault of the left is they don't understand capitalism is not a zero sum game. It's a positive sum game. <laughs> but 
doing anything different from the market portfolio is a zero sum game. The only way you can do better is if somebody else does worse. Right. So this is, I just, I wanted to restate your question because it's such an important insight and, and many, uh, it's very hard for investors, especially in institutional context, to sit down and say, well, let's just throw it in total market portfolio, find the lowest fees we can. No, we have to think, we have to adjust, we have to, uh, do, no. <laughs> in fact, by just holding the market, you protect yourself against being the dumb guy. Uh, every, many models of trading have the informed investor and the, and the liquidity investor. Well, don't be the liquidity investor. Don't be the mark. Uh, as I think I, I said in the article, uh, you know, um, if you're having a dinner with lions, make sure that you are at the table, not on the menu. <laughs> Somebody's on the menu. <laughs> make sure it's not you. Well, holding the market portfolio is a great defense against being the dumb guy. So that was your question. Now, let's get to your answer. Why shouldn't everybody hold the market portfolio? Well, there's plenty of reasons not to hold the market portfolio. And here's where I think general equilibrium thinking comes into mind. When you walk into the grocery store, you don't have to think about the general equilibrium. I'm in Palo Alto, the market for arugula. <laughs> you just say, well, do I like arugula? What does it cost? Let's buy it. Um, but that's uh, in, in financial markets, You know, the, the expected returns, the risks are not very clear. So I think if you can go into the market understanding, oh, you know, arugula is two fifty nine a pound. Uh, everybody else thinks it contributes to climate change. Uh, I don't. There's a reason why it might be cheap. That gives you encouragement that you're actually getting a deal. So understanding what the equilibrium of the market is, who's buying, who's selling, why, and why the market might reward you for doing something, uh, I think is a useful discipline for investing. Now, finally, I think I'll answer your question. <laughs> Why should you, with this great insight, do something different from everybody else? Well, you might be genuinely smarter than everybody else. You might be genuinely better informed than other people. Good luck to you on that one. Uh, you certainly might have a different uh, ability to take risk. So uh, you might want to be an insurance company um, and, and simply say, well, I, uh, you know, the average investor is somebody who, who has started a business and made a lot of money in it, but they still own a business. So they're, if they're doing their jobs right, they're thinking hard about integrating their business risk and their portfolio risk. So uh, in a time when, you know, the average person, like December 2009, or Mar I guess March 2009 was the all-time buying opportunity that I didn't take. And I can tell you guys didn't take either because you're still working for a living or, or whatever. But, uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, if you can spot that everybody else is, they are really worried about the risks of their business. And so they're dumping, even though they understand this is probably a good time to buy. Um, then that's, and you know, but you're a tenured professor or you're retired, you can afford to take a risk that you understand other people want to get rid of. You're probably going to get paid a premium to do it. Actually, uh, March 1934. Uh, if you can go back in, if you can get a time machine, go back to March 1934. That was the all-time bottom of the Great Depression. Uh, the, that was the greatest single month in stock returns ever. Uh, and, and so you want to buy February 1934, go back and, and tell great-grandfather to buy. Uh, because, and you know, there's some, you know, there's the depths of the Great Depression. There was, and there was, you're still taking risk. There was a good chance that uh, America turned fascist and socialist uh, and communist in the middle of the Great Depression. There was a good chance that we lost World War II. There's all sorts of risks there, you, but it, it was a good bet. <laughs> uh, so um, if you can, I think the best one is if you can identify your ability to take risk as different from other people, that justifies uh, buying. And uh, most importantly, now here's, here's where we get a little fluffy, which stocks do you buy? Hmm. Do you buy value stocks, growth stocks, momentum stocks? Which industries do you invest in? How do you avoid the good stock versus good company fallacy? Um, <laughs> uh, I think there, uh, understand if you could understand uh, what risks are uh, in different categories of stocks, who is buying them, who is better served to taking them. I, I, th I think that is probably the, the great. The market timing happens slowly, but the. Uh, the uh, sector allocation, the the style allocation, that's that's something that you can do at different times. I, I think understanding your risk 
sparing of capacity relative to you know various sector styles and factors would be really the way to think about that. I don't have good answers about that. No one has good answers about that. Uh, the, the one I would say is don't invest in your own company. Right. Don't invest in your own industry, <laughs> uh, be, which is the, one of the biggest mistakes people make. They load up on their own company. Even the, the geniuses at long-term capital management had borrowed money to invest in their own company. Come on, guys. Uh, you, you don't want to do that. That That is just multiplying risks. Um, so we can start always start with don't pay too many taxes and risk management. Uh, those are zero. Those are completely free. Free. Uh, you don't need to chase alpha for that. It's not a zero sum game. And one of the aspects of risk management is, uh, you know, even though everybody thinks their own industry is the industry of the future, even the coal people thought that. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, keeping enough money out of the wonderful rewards of your own industry and your own company so that if things go bad, you can uh, survive is uh, that's a classic example of, of this kind of thinking about heterogeneity. Even if even if your company is a great company and mm -hmm. you, you think it's a great return opportunity, it might not work out. The FTC could decide that you're a monopoly and 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 destroy it. <laughs> Uh, or, or the, or the um, SEC could decide you do, you contribute too much to climate change and destroy it. So uh, even if you think it's a great opportunity, uh, you should be investing less in it than the average person because you are exposed to that risk. And, and if we could, if we can make that case more generally for factor risks, I think we would have a much better framework for understanding who should invest in factor risks and who should. So that that makes a lot of sense for for the unpriced risks. What about the priced risks? Like the, the the you mentioned the value factor. So if someone's sitting down deciding how to allocate their portfolio, how does someone decide if they are able to bear the the value risk premium? Well, there used to be a good answer for this back when there was a value risk premium, yeah. uh, which I, I still uncontent. I mean, it's just it's done badly in the last ten years, and in some sense, uh, value that 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 means uh, yeah, that that means. It, when they said it was a risk, not a not a perpetual alpha, they were right. They, you know, there's a risk yeah. that doesn't do well. Um, certainly, when you look at the value stocks, it correlates very much with things that feel like risk. So th this was back in the days when there was a reliable value premium. I'll tell you my story for the value premium and who should invest in it. Uh, I, I would uh, start my MBA class on the value stocks by saying, "Value premium, look, isn't this wonderful?" Uh, we'll look at this wonderful alpha. Let's all invest. And they say, yeah, let's all invest. Then I would get out a list of what the value stocks were. <laughs> and you would see railroads. You would see Sears Roebuck. <laughs> you would see, you know, company after company on the verge in old dying industries on the verge of bankruptcy or very low price, you know, just turning out steel mills churning out earnings uh, at a very low price, no growth opportunities, no sexiness, very little trading, no information content in these industries, you know, whereas the opposite, of course, is the, the, the Googles or the Yahoos, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, all the sexy ones. And then I'd say, okay, who wants to buy these stocks? And so you've got to be kidding. I'm not buying that junk over there. I'm buying the sexy stuff over here. I'd say, well, there's a value premium. <laughs> now, <laughs> Uh, that does, looking at it gives you some sense, uh, you know, there was a strong economic difference between the value stocks and the growth stocks. So you could tell a story about um, people not holding the value stocks. Uh, we tried to tell a story, and, and actually, you know, the fact that value stocks did uh, badly in the last recession, they, 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 it was a big puzzle in the 90s that value stocks didn't seem to do badly in recessions. So why are people who are afraid of recessions not buying value stocks? Well, they've started to do badly in recessions. So they're kind of coming back as an economic risk factor in, in that sense. But they also, um, there's another, uh, we haven't really talked about the view of stock markets as a information, a trading mechanism. Mm. And there's, uh, you know, the Bitcoin element of stock market valuation is real and is economically true. Uh, people do quote overpay for stocks when there's a lot of information and new technology and enormous opportunities and, and so forth. And uh, so another reason, if you view stocks, if you view the economic general equilibrium function of stocks is that way, that's another reason to uh, stay away from, you certainly want to stay away from GameStop. <laughs> 
So, you know, anything that's involved in a short squeeze, huge uh, trading, to, well, to some extent, there's some GameStop involved in Tesla as well. Hmm. And so if you're a long run investor, that's another argument. If you're, if you're not an informed investor, not somebody who's playing the trading game, then there's no reason to hold stocks, a lot of whose valuation is involved in the trading game. So that's another economic reason one might want to hold value stocks. I'm making it up here. I'm, this is more and more, uh, you know, <laughs> topics for future research that I wish I could persuade graduate students to pay more attention to. So let's shift to portfolio structure. Um, is there a single optimal portfolio for all investors, like in the Markowitz mean variance portfolio theory? Well, <laughs> if I think about market clearing, right? Markets have to clear. Everything has to get held. So what that says is that in aggregate, this is like a definition. Investors hold the market portfolio, where the market portfolio is not just stocks, it's everything. So that it all gets held. So that's your that's the central portfolio of every asset pricing model. Every asset pricing model starts with that and says, deviate from that according to your taste for different dimensions of, of, of risk. But your center, your central portfolio is basically this market, uh, market overall market portfolio. So that's uh, that's a good place to start for any investor, I think. You mentioned the market portfolio. Is the stock market a good proxy for the theoretical? Okay. No, because there are too many other assets out, out there, you know? So I got, I got to bring the bonds in too. Okay. So the gl global stock and bond markets is a better proxy for the market. Right. And then, you know, I got to start asking myself, what other investments do I have access to and should those be part of the market? So there's some uncertainty about what I should do about government bonds. So are government bonds an asset or a liability? For, you know, you and I are, we can go long government bonds, but we're really, we're really on the short end too because we're going to be the ones that pay them off. Uh, so oh, wow. not, not clear that the net supply of government bonds from our perspective, is that anything other than zero? Because we're on both sides. What What about other other assets like private equity or alternative investments? Right. So those are I don't. In principle, everything that's that could be put into your portfolio is is, is part of the market. Now the question is, do you really have access to those things? in an efficient way, in the sense that, you know, you can do it with relatively low uh, costs. So we don't, have, we don't have good models to answer that, that question. Um, we, uh, we all, the other thing that's really um, bad, you know, some of my colleagues who work on this, Steve Kaplan in particular, is, is uh, you know, what is the expected return on on private equity. The data don't give you a good answer to that because they're so self-selected. You only get to see the ones that survive pretty much. So you don't get to see how much money was put in there that, that blew up and was, to was, was, was totally lost. Uh, and that's very important, very important. Um, so I, I don't know what, if I were on your side of the table and I had to advise investors what to do, I don't know what I'd do about private equity because I don't think the data are good enough for me to give you a good answer. So why is the cap weighted market portfolio a good starting point for Well, that's what, that's what people have to that's what the that's what the population has to hold in aggregate. Right? That that is the market as far as the population is concerned. You know, in aggregate we have to hold all the assets out there cap weighted. Now you can deviate from that. You can deviate from that, but you know, when you do, you know, you don't have the market portfolio anymore. What what determines that? What what determines when an investor should tilt their portfolio away from the market? Taste. Add, you know, attitudes towards different dimensions. I think of them as different dimensions of risk, but attitudes towards different dimensions of risk are um, what do it. You know, in Merton's perspective, it's basically your attitude towards these whatever these underlying state variables are that generate premiums in various dimensions. In, in the CAPM theory, there's there's a this theoretical single optimal portfolio based on mean and variance. In 
in ICAPM, it, it sounds like there's the the optimal portfolio for any individual investor is going to depend on the sensitivities that that investor has to all of the risks that are out there. Does that make sense to say? Yes, but I let me just clarify or, or expand on that. What we're seeing here is that you have that the you have these systematic risks of which there are now many of them, and individual investors are affected by them. And so the portfolios that they want to hold, if you want to think of their putting together their optimal portfolio, let's say hypothetically I'm an advisor and I'm trying to put a hypothetically a, a optimal portfolio for you. What I'm going to say is it's not simply your exposure to the market and the risk-free asset as in the CAPM. It's your exposure to the market, your exposure to interest rates, just all these big systematic risks, okay? And therefore, you're going to have not just two portfolios, the optimal combination of risky assets and risk-free. You're going to have, you can have as one of your portfolios, the market portfolio, the same one you would use for the CAPM, just for a starting point. But then you say, I have all these other risks that I need a portfolio to hedge that risk. So, mm. you know, if I'm worried about interest rates going down and I'm about to retire, I want to hedge that. Okay? So it's exactly conceptually the same as the CAPM, but it expands it to multi dimensions. And the, mm. the issue is which of those provides risk premia? That would be the question for pricing. But from the point of view of designing the portfolio, you want to know what those are, but you, these are the risks that you want to expose. Now, there are individual risks, like our you know, mortality, okay, which are not systematic in the sense that any one person's death is pretty, pretty independent. But you can buy assets or securities to hedge that risk, as you know. You can buy life insurance or you can buy... Uh, you know, annuities that go the other way in case you live longer than you thought. So I, I'm not sure if I'm completely answering exactly what you're asking, but I would say is from the individual's point of view, we tailor to all those risks. From a market pricing point of view, risk premium, factors uh, that, that should have risk premium, then these, the systematic factors are the ones that I've described. And, and they, you know, there's, the, you could have a list of them. Uh, if you like, I'm happy to provide it for you. You can provide it to your readers. But, but the, it's, it's, it's in the same idea, except the world is multi-period and that there are more risks than just end-of-period wealth to worry about. Hmm. Interesting. And don't, yeah. How do we know whether we have identified the right factors to proxy for the, the multiple risks that all us investors are worried about? Very good question. And... Uh, you know, the way I would answer is, is it's, it's, it's like anything else in science. You have some theories as to what would be there. I've given you a few that you think would likely to be candidates with risk premium. Older people like to have long bonds. They have a big demand for them. Younger people like you, uh, you know, uh, may not so much. So you're, we're going to have different tastes in that domain, and that's what makes a market. I'm going to want the long bonds that would be in your market portfolio, and I'm going to bid them away from you if I want to get them. So there's a lot of old people will affect the, that, that asset's price. I'm just trying to give you a, a concrete example. So that's, that's how we would uh, uh, look at each of these risks, and we try to say, what are potential factors? That's the first point. They exist, and they will always exist, by the way. They don't go away. You know, people talk about crowded trades or, you know, something goes away. They never go away because these are real risks that are, that are being born. OK, but what else is how do I actually find those factors? It's in the end an empirical question, because first of all, you can't always find the ones that you like to have in theory. And we use those to start with. Secondly, there's a whole industry out there looking for factors. OK, uh, and you've probably seen the papers, I don't know, 400 factors, you know, there's factors for everything. And that is extreme. So how, how you do it? Well, it's a mixture of empirical and trying to say, is this factor 
a structural factor like interest rate risk, or is it a instrumental variable for it? That's a fancy way of saying it's not that it's not that risk that we are looking at. Let's say size, for example. Size is not a fundamental risk. Okay, it, it, yeah, it it it, it, isn't, it isn't anything. But size is correlated or related to some factors that appear to be there all the time. So it's a surrogate factor. So there's the primary factor, that's the causal factor that, you, you know, the ones I've been giving you examples of. And then they're the ones you find empirically. And you have to try to how to unsort those and figure out which ones are real factors that you can kind of depend on. And that's what Farmer and French did, you know, decades ago when they said, well, we seem to have identified a thing called size and a thing called uh, uh, a value uh, in their thing, and we seem to be able to show this is systematic. They would be the first to say that size obviously is not a fundamental causal factor. If it were, I mean, let me just, just quickly to show you why it can't be. If size... If I was a corporate finance person deciding to run my firm, and if I increased the size of my uh, portfolio, my cost of capital goes down because the expected return is smaller, holding everything else fixed. How could I make my firm more valuable overnight? Merge with another firm. Now I'm a bigger firm, same cash flows, but because I'm bigger, I have a lower discount rate, a lower cost of capital, and instant value. Well, that doesn't work. And, you know, so it's very tricky to try to, you know, unscramble this. I, I'm sorry to be a little vague about it, but I'm trying to give you the intuition of why size can't be a fundamental risk the same way interest rates are. Do you see what I mean? Because otherwise you have a money machine. So mm -hmm. we have to find ways to identify surrogate factors that we believe are stable or at least we can predict when they are changing or when they may not be stable and that's the game or the of doing it right of finding all these factors so you know how would i if you want a quick prescription of a, my list of what i would look for uh you know what is a good sign for a factor one is that it's <laughs> it's been there for a long long time you know, something that's been there for decades is much more, and it takes decades, by the way. Ten years is not a sh long time for trying to estimate whether a factor is really there. So if, it's, if it has a you know, long history of being there, that's one thing. Is it pervasive? Is it true in the United States? Is it true in Europe? Is it true in Asia? Is it a fundamental element that way, or is it a surrogate for something that's local? And that work has also been done. So you want to know if it's pervasive, if it's, if, if it's uh, 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 been there a long time. And, you know, you want to do, uh, let's see, what, what else would I put on my list of, uh, uh, of elements? Oh, it has to be continuous. I mean, if size is a real element, and we know it's a surrogate, I've already explained that to you, but if size is a real element, then it should show itself as you go across different subsets of sizes from large cap to smallest cap, okay? It shouldn't just be for the two tails, the smallest one and the largest one. Do you see what I mean? You ought to see it mm -hmm. all the way across if it's really size that's mattering. If something is midsize, it should have a risk premium somewhere between small cap and large cap. You know, and so... That's another test you do empirically. But maybe you can elaborate with more questions on it. But the fundamental idea is that in the end, as with all science, it's got to be subjected to the data. All right? Now, some things are easier to understand, and the theory is more robust. Here, you have ideas for where those factors would come from. But the actual ones that you can use is an empirical one. And that's, you know, that's, that's life. Uh, you know, that's how you figure them out. You have and people who are really good at doing that and do careful jobs, great. But it's, it's you know, now you have another kind of factor thing where they just put a, you know, they just feed it into a, a, 
uh, you know, a, one of these machine learning things, and they come up with elements and so on there. Those are much different in my view. That, I mean, they may or may not give you insights as to what's going on, but those are probably not likely to pick up the same kinds of factors that I'm talking about. Can you reiterate that or say it, say it a different way? I, I think what you just said was important. Yeah, I mean, you mean about the about the about, are you talking about why the market portfolio is 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 an optimal portfolio to hold if you don't have information? Yes. Yeah. So this is, I think, a very important point. I mean, we obviously emphasize it when we teach finance, but I think that in general, this is not emphasized enough. Which is, if you are trading, any time you trade, and you don't have information, if the other side of the person has information, you, you lose, right? That's the nature of the game. If somebody has more information than you and you trade with them, you're on the losing side. So the extent to which that, that if you know you don't have information and, and you know there is information out there, what you want to do is don't trade, right? And the way you don't trade is you buy the market portfolio. You buy it once, you hold it, and you sell it. And if you... so. Th I, actually, it's more subtle than that. It's not just don't trade, but why the market? Why not just any portfolio? The reason why the market is particularly good is you're buying it in the economy-wide weights. You're not emphasizing any stock. Somebody with information is going to emphasize some stock over another stock. If you're on the other side of that trade, that means you have the opposite you're doing exactly opposite to them and you will lose. So what you want to make sure is you're never exactly opposite of somebody with information. How do you do that? You just buy the market because the market, you're not opposite to anything. You're in the weights of the whole economy. 